Hello, and welcome to Mayor Brown's podcast series, Credibly Challenged. This podcast focuses on risk management issues for financial institutions of all sizes, particularly those in the banking sector. My name is Matt Bizantz, and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's financial services practice. Joining me today is Mickey Shemi, who's managing director of Guy Carpenter's North America Structured Credit Practice. Before that, he was at FHFA as a principal advisor. We'll hear more about what he did in the government. And he has a, a long history in, in risk and structured credit. So, uh, Mickey, welcome to the program and thank you for joining us today. Matt, thank you very much for having me. So I think for many of our listeners, government, um, government folk are most interesting because there's this mystery to the government and, and what their expectations are, how they think about risk. So. Maybe could you tell me a bit about your background, particularly in the government? Yeah, uh, yeah, ap- absolutely. And I think it's it's a little bit of a winding path, uh, you know, to the government, but but it was all part uh, of the same sort of thematic work. Um, you know, like you said, I I now lead uh, uh, Guy Carpenter's North America Structured Credit Business. Uh, I actually joined Guy Carpenter's amazing mortgage and structured credit team just a bit over two months ago in, in November. And th- that team is under the leadership of, of Jeff Crone and the capabilities he has built there over the recent years are unmatched. I, I, I can say that also because I've spent my career in investment and investment banking, working with banks, other financial institutions, uh, government entities on issues related to regulatory capital management, strategies with a special focus on 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 capital and credit risk transfer transactions and um obviously since the financial crisis in 2008 these these topics have received significant attention where before the discussion of basel one and basel two risk weighted assets was fairly mundane and and relegated to a very small world uh and to that point i was at christopherson robin company which is probably the earliest dedicated investor to risk sharing transaction with banks from even before the financial crisis. This is across a variety of asset classes and just I would say more broadly CRC has a pension for for regulatory capital related investments uh, beyond just synthetic securitizations, but other structures and also other parts of the bank's capital structure. But I was also at Mollis and Company in their financial institutions uh, advisor group and there again uh, primarily focused on working with financial institutions on strategic challenges they were facing, especially capital constraints in the uh, uh, United States and in, in, in Europe primarily. Worked with banks, non-banks, large non-bank SIFIs, uh, and these included engagements at various times, as you can imagine, on the corporate side, investment banking advisory, uh, uh, and also on creditor side as well. Uh, in certain distressed um, financial situations, along with work that was related to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the, the GSCs. And, and it was that work around the GSCs uh, that was somewhat fairly uncharacteristic for Molus as an investment bank because um, it had a very public dimension to it. We developed, you might recall, a, sort of a viable future for the enterprises uh, I would characterize as a realistic capital built process at the mm-hmm. enterprises and showed how CRT could be integrated in, in into that framework as a capital management tool, not, not, not a replacement for capital for or equity capital, but a complementary tool to it. And it it really was was the combination of this work that that brought me to FHA FHFA in 2021 uh, to work on capital building initiatives over 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 the last couple of years. But that's also sort of the path, and I'm sure, I'm sure we can get into that work in a second, but that's also the path that brought me to, to Guy Carpenter and uh, the mortgage and structured credit team under Jeff. It was just sort of a convergence of all these factors in terms of my background, working with banks and the GSCs and working on CRT and structured credit, um, along with Guy Carpenter's position and capabilities, building CRT solutions with the reinsurance market, which all intersect with the opportunity that exists now for the reinsurance market to be a source of capital to banks and other financial institutions makes 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 the use case for what Guy Carpenter 
uh, and the team here has put together even clearer going forward. And I'm sure we'll get to that in, in a bit. I, yeah, I've been practicing a little over 10 years, and I <clears throat> really didn't think at the beginning of my career that the um, enterprises would still be in conservatorship 10 years later, that I just assumed at some point necessity would would force action um, to either privatize them, nationalize them, whatever the solution could be, um, recap and uh, release them. Um, and, and I know that for a while, one of the issues was the capital, that it was um, there wasn't really a way to build capital because of the way Treasury was was taking the earnings and, and the way the preferred holders were still subject to it. And you're right, it, it was impressive when, when you came in um, in 2021 and, and really developed a, a workable strategy, a workable framework for the enterprises to start building capital. And I think it was also impressive um, how the enterprises have made things like credit risk transfer work that, um, yes, that does predate the 2008 financial crisis. But if you if you had said that the enterprises would be innovating in credit risk transfer ahead of U.S. banking organizations, I think most people would have thought that was crazy. So it, it, that's a, that's an impressive experience you bring to, to, to Guy Carpenter. Um, what is your thought on on the future of the GSEs and 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 particularly credit risk transfer at the GSEs? Yeah, so you know, taking a step back during my time uh, at, at at FHFA, um, you know, I was there for for a couple of years in the role of a principal advisor. Of course, FHFA is the regulator and importantly the conservator of Fannie and Freddie. Um, FHFA had rolled out the Enterprise Regulatory Capital Framework, you know, commonly known as the ERCF, in 2020, before my time there. And certainly there were plenty of people who had opinions around the framework. Uh, you know, our focus a couple of years ago, as the ERCF became effective and a little bit less theoretical, was to make sure that Fannie and Freddie had the appropriate tools to manage the ERCF requirements. So, you know, I primarily led um, various initiatives at FHFA that related to new capital building at the GSEs, and you've sort of hinted at it uh, a second ago. And really, the first item was resuscitating CRT in late 2021 through a variety of measures. Most most obvious uh, was the amendments to the ERCF as it related to the risk-based capital treatment of CRT and the leverage ratio buffer. It was just obvious that the ERCF wasn't meeting FHFA's stated objectives at the time. Uh, and you know we were worried about some potentially distorted uh, decision making at, at at the GSCs. You know another big item uh, in terms of capital building was updating the GSCs mortgage guarantee fee pricing framework, which uh, is quite impactful as the GSCs are retaining earnings. There again, we took a series of different steps, including what I would call rejigging the relatively stale upfront fee framework. No, we we wanted the risk-based pricing framework to be more closely aligned to the ERCF risk-based capital framework. And it gave us an opportunity to um, get rid of some stale elements of the GFI framework that had prevailed for quite a long time, ensured that the GSEs improved their capital bill process while also delivering their pricing support for, for borrowers who are limited by income or by wealth in a, in a more targeted manner. And now all of these initiatives uh, we felt also had to be aggregated somewhere on an enterprise wide basis so that the impact of these actions can really be assessed in aggregate over time, which is also why we embarked on long term capital planning. Which is now done uh, on, on an annual basis The rulemaking is a great complement to, to to stress testing. Now, getting back to to you know to your question, you know what did this FHFA leadership want to achieve? Right, you know, early in 2022, uh, Director Thompson gave a talk at the Bipartisan Policy Center where she laid out some of her priorities for her leadership. What what I remember from that talk is that she spoke about preparing the GSCs to adjust to supervision in a way that they would be regulated outside of conservatorship. Basically, focus in on steps that makes the GSCs look more like normal course of business financial institutions. And, you know, in that talk, um, she 
you know, she shared a series of steps that she had wanted to take to make sure the GSCs, again, as mentioned earlier, have the proper tools at their disposal to meet their market role, their mission responsibilities while improving their, their safety and soundness and CRT and pricing were, were certainly part of that. I think unlike past FHFA leadership that, that I think gave the market an impression of some precipitous big bang moment of the GSCs exiting conservatorship, I think this FHFA's approach is more of a series of small steps rather than um, a big step approach to make sure that the GSCs are, are best position to succeed and, and certain actions that are in the regulatory sphere um, through rule make through rulemaking uh, like capital planning are better done that way rather than through conservatorship action you know? so bringing all that together and you, you know, again to go back to your question what is the future of the GSEs um, conservatorship has achieved much certainly uh, CRT is one of those accomplishments. There are also a number of very significant hidden or, or underappreciated costs to continuing the conservatorships as well. Um, you know, now that, that Fannie and Freddie are in year 15 and 16 under this construct. So, you know, FHFA over the last couple of years really focused on the actions that it could take unilaterally to better position the GSCs to succeed, whether now or in a post-conservatorship environment. But ultimately, FHFA is limited in what it can do on its own, and many of the remaining decisions have to be taken um, together with Treasury and possibly other stakeholders. And there is a difference in the coming years. Uh, unlike in the past, where there could be some amount of can kicking around decision making mm -hmm. as it relates to the future of the GSEs, the enterprises do continue to build capital. And we are marching pretty quickly toward the expiration of Treasury's equity warrants. And so mm -hmm. unless we want these to expire worthless for the U.S. taxpayer, Treasury and FHFA will actually have to make decisions around the nature of Treasury's investments in the GSCs. And, you know, it's just with that, with that in mind, it's just hard to see how these questions remain unaddressed and decisions not made into perpetuity. That's not necessarily a view one way or another. Mm -hmm. It's just recognizing that there are objective circumstances that may require decision making unlike uh, years past. That's really interesting, Mickey. Um, thank you for that perspective on, on where the GSEs are, are going and, and hopefully um, they get there. I know it uh, takes a crisis in Washington to kind of get anything to happen. Um, and and maybe this will hopefully get Congress to act before the expiration of the warrants. One idea that at least is very attractive to me from the GSEs, regardless of where they end up, is, is the idea of this credit risk transfer technology as a way to transfer risks among financial institutions. Um, and so, again, regardless of where the GSEs end up, I'd love to export that so that other financial institutions can use it. Um, do you have any thoughts really on how it's worked, what you saw from the inside? Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. I think there are a lot of lessons learned from from the GSCs that could be exported, as as you say, to other pockets of the financial world. Um, you know, I, I just mentioned some risks of continuing the conservatorships, but objectively, uh, the development of CRT is one of the bigger achievements of the conservatorship. Um, you know, but CRT now has changing strategy and objectives that's probably worthwhile lingering on for just a minute. Uh, in 2013, when when GSC CRT was first launched through basically, I would say early 2020, uh, CRT was the only tool the GSCs had in place to manage risk, so it seemed, on an enterprise-wide basis when they were not retaining capital, not retaining earnings. Uh, at the time, CRT was seen as a risk management tool, a tool to de-risk the taxpayer. Uh, in the years sort of immediately following 2008 and the beginning of the conservatorship, and even zooming out in the context of housing finance reform, right? You just mentioned Congress. Some some had advocated that the GSCs should only be allowed to execute CRT as part of their capital management strategy. Then, as the enterprises began to retain earnings again, really in early 2020, 
uh, and this obviously has become the main tool for capital building at the GSEs. Some voices, even those coming from FHFA at the time, really questioned the rationale behind CRT and seemed to advocate for the GSEs to abandon or you know, significantly step away from, from CRT. And both of these, what I would call bipolar approaches, well, 100% CRT or 0% CRT seemed really strange to me. Uh, you know, already in my previous professional life in 2016 and 2017, me and my team discussed publicly how CRT should be integrated into a stable equity capital base at the GSCs. This was before FHFA had released any sort of risk-based capital framework before the GSCs. Uh, began retaining earnings, but you know more, more, more importantly than my personal feelings on this, this FHFA leadership, beginning in late 2021, uh, really adopted an approach to get CRT on more stable footing in the context of the GSC's capital build process. You know, first was to actually revive the programs through a variety of measures, as we as we discussed, capital rule was amended, but also other structural features were introduced at, at the time, you know, along with other performance measures to assess the viability of CRT in the context of helping the GSCs close their uh, regulatory capital shortfall and you know, help their organic capital generation process. So, so there has been a uh, certain evolution in the role of CRT, where CRT now is really seen as a capital management and optimization tool complementing the GSCs capital build process rather than the sole source of capital. Now, what was also uh, challenging, right, are some, uh, you know, circumstances that the CRT market faced over the last couple of years or has faced over the last couple of years, you know. So we said FHFA wanted to revive CRT in late 2021, get it on stable footing. But Matt, those, those efforts coincided right with significant shifts in the market. Right. You know, right. I, and I don't know if if unprecedented is the right term, but it really does seem the programs have faced challenges that just weren't there for the first eight or nine years of CRT's exist, existence. You know, both enterprises are now retaining capital and issuing CRT simultaneously. And that really never happened before 2022 in a meaningful way. Um, 2022 and 2023 also marked the beginning of significant interest rate and spread volatility. And that's also uh, new for the CRT experience, it just wasn't there in any sustained fashion previously, right? So we had increased CRT issuance into tougher financial conditions, into tougher market conditions. Um, and, and, and with that, you know, CRT had to compete with other products given spread widening, maybe in a way it, it it hadn't before, but you know, putting this all together, whether it's a shift in CRT strategy we discussed a second ago, or or these challenges, I think what this really ultimately means is that is that CRT uh, is part of the GSE's capital build process, but will also likely have to continue to to evolve and and innovate. And and while I know you were certainly innovative in in your time at government. Um, government is a slow actor that they think in years trying to plan out lengthy strategies and 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 that is a luxury that that those of us in in the private sector don't have that um, i i know guy carpenter does have an active um practice of 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 working with the gses on on transactions and and it's certainly that is more nimble um but but even more nimble than than working with the gses is going out there and doing deals with private enterprises. So how has that transition been from you going from the, the slower public sector to the really fast moving pace at Guy Carpenter? No, that's that that's that's a great question. You know, in a certain way, I feel like, you know, I'm coming home uh, to to a large degree. Uh, you know, so so as as you mentioned, as I, I mentioned right in the beginning, you know, I began my current role leading uh, Guy Carpenter's North America structured credit business within the mortgage and structured credit team this past November, so about eight weeks ago. Um, this is a multidisciplinary team uh, led by Jeff Crone and, and has absolutely incredible capabilities that have been built over the years that I can really say combine best in class expertise in CRT, risk advisory, regulatory insights, analytics, and structuring to advise financial institutions that 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 hold 
uh, portfolio credit risk across a wide range of asset classes. And the team, it's both here in the United States and in Europe, is, is devoted to helping these clients, whether they're banks, insurance companies, other financial institutions, public sector agencies, uh, you know, we, we can help them understand the impact of credit risk and the opportunities to just better manage capital, volatility, growth, profitability, and just better meet strategic objectives. And you know, with with GC's strength in structuring, um, analytics, advisory, there are natural opportunities for for reinsurers who have been involved in CRT to to further allocate their their capital in the broader structured credit universe globally with granular portfolios of of credit risk. And I was going to say that one of the the risks that we often hear about here is is the um, the risk of siloing, and it sounds like uh, GC is well positioned that with your global footprint, you're part of the Marsh McLennan broader organization. I know you're active in European risk transfer. You have deep ties to the reinsurance industry, and and now as you're rolling out your division to a wider variety of U.S. banks and and kind of making all of those connections. Um, how do you see that affecting, like, how, how do you bring all of those services to help banks avoid siloing their relationships in, say, a single counterparty? Yeah, I, I think one thing that, that's, that's important to, to, to highlight here is that, um, you're right, Guy Carpenter is, is Marsh McLennan's um, reinsurance intermediary and advisor. Uh, but we also have a broker dealer entity within within Guy Carpenter, and that's GC Securities, where we 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 can help and have helped clients execute through fully funded CRT transactions as well, not just re reinsurance transactions. Uh, you know, so 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 we really can present uh, diverse execution alternatives and capabilities to to banks and 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 other clients, and of course, being part of the Marsh McLennan um, sort of ecosystem. You know, we have. We have the the you know the horsepower of all the other opcos uh, as well. That's really impressive, and, and yeah, I've, I've certainly seen that um, through. I think you're affiliated with Oliver Wyman as well, who puts out some great um, ORX risk transfer um, pro like concepts. Um, but now thinking about to the products that Guy Carpenter might be intermediating or introducing. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about where your vision is for for bank CRT and and bringing it to the U.S.? So, you know, with respect to new opportunities, the, the the big one that's being discussed now and is in the headlines is is, is finally uh, the emergence of bank CR, of the bank CRT market in the United States. Uh, obviously, as as you well know, and Guy Carpenter has has involvement in in, in there as well. There's expansive use of CRT or SRT, significant risk transfer as it's known in Europe, by banks uh, in many jurisdictions, right, all the way from the UK and into the continent and now into Southern and Eastern Europe as well. And, and not only in Europe, you know, Canada and other geographies, certainly. Uh, and, and many of the first movers here were already sharing risk under Basel I and Basel II regimes, uh, as, as, as we had mentioned before. Um, but that same market hasn't really emerged in the U.S. outside of the GSEs. And people have long expected the market here to develop. Year after year, it never happens, and people ask why. Uh, and people's first instinct is to blame regulators, that there is a lack of regulatory clarity around the capital treatment of these transactions under the prevailing rules. And, you know, maybe maybe that's 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 partly it. But I think it's more fundamentally uh, has also been the lack of a use case for U.S. banks, at least for, from my perspective. Coming out of 2008, uh, U.S. banks took the opportunity to recapitalize, were forced to recapitalize, and have stronger balance sheets, generally speaking, than many of their international counterparts. So they haven't have been RWA constrained, risk-weighted asset constrained in the same way, for example, or balance sheet constrained as uh, their international counterparts. And you know, the market perception of their strength uh, has also been seen by the fact that their securities have also traded a generally stronger valuation. So, so if banks or a particular bank did have some capital need, 
they in all likely have other viable options uh, at their immediate disposal. And so, you know, they, they haven't had to develop capital management tools in the U.S. in the same way that some of their uh, international counterparts have. But, but you know, these factors appear to be changing. Um, and you you probably know this better better than I do. You know, but but regulatory capital is not an exact science. Reasonable right. people can disagree on capital levels. You know, when I was at FHFA, uh, the priority was making sure that the GSEs had the right tools at their disposal mm -hmm. to manage the capital requirements, whether high or low or in the middle, uh, whether through CRT or or otherwise. And the parallels are there in my mind for banks and other uh, market participants. We can't demand all these new requirements to be put in place without providing banks the tools to manage these requirements. And that's what we've more recently seen from the Fed. Uh, right. Outside of the Basel III endgame rule proposals, actual willingness to consider CRT transactions as an effective capital management tool. The Fed has released guidance through FAQs, Certain letters to specific banks blessing CRT transactions have been made public. And all this indicates more of a green light for banks to pursue these transactions for capital management purposes. And I, I, I get it. Yeah. You know, this guidance may not be everything that market participants right. want, but and the process may be cumbersome and time consuming, but it's a huge step forward. Right. It makes a lot of sense. And, and I think it's um, it's an interesting idea of CRT as just one of the new potential opportunities out there that, that you know, um, again, being part of such a big organization at Guy Carpenter with your resources, um, are there other opportunities that you see for banks in their, their balance sheet optimization beyond just the traditional CRT that I might be wedded to? Yeah, there, there, there might be, and those, and those, and those will, will, will emerge, right? And we're, we're considering these different options all the time. I, I mean, I think one, one challenge is that you know financial conditions now are you know more volatile than they have been since since two thousand eight, given moves in rates and spreads, the ongoing inflation or recession debate. So, so navigating these these waters as a bank is is more challenging. But you know the key takeaway here is that banks, not not only GSIPs, but but regional banks as well, have really started to think more actively about balance sheet constraints and more active capital management strategies in a way that you know Matt, to my mind, uh, they haven't had to ever think about in mm -hmm. recent years. Uh, and banks have been quite public in discussing these challenges and solutions around them, uh, whether it's in earnings calls or or other forms, and then actual deals that you see mm -hmm. now in the market getting done from new entrants that from from new entrants that you know that is banks who have begun issuing crt transactions for the first time and you know we believe this is probably just just the start of of uh, th th that that process well that is great that i would love to bring crt to the masses with you because i i think it is a great risk transfer technique for helping many of the listeners of this podcast manage their balance sheet constraints, optimize their, their capital stack, and, you know, maybe get back to lending like, like banks have been doing for the last 400 years. So that, that's Matt, you know, I think, I think that's actually a, a very important point mm -hmm. yeah. is that, you know, that's one of the key takeaways for me uh, is that these new banks, you know, have started looking at CRT more accurately mm -hmm. as well. You know, I don't know what your experience has been, but but I, I remember speaking to bank management teams over the years in the US and elsewhere who were less familiar with these transactions and didn't really have mm -hmm. a clear understanding of CRT's objectives. You know, it's really not strictly about risk management mm -hmm. or or a tool to shed credit risk that a bank doesn't want. It's sort of the exact opposite, right? There's really an emerging understanding across bank leaderships that CRT is there to manage regulatory capital, cost of capital, other constraints for businesses they like, for clients they like, for businesses mm -hmm. and clients they want to grow. That's what right. CRT is really there for. Uh, and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I think, I think, I think we're, we're, we're hopeful, uh, you know, just, just, just the way you are. Well, it's great. Well, Mickey, thank you so much for being on this program. I've I've known Jeff for a few years, and I've been impressed with what he's built at Guy Carpenter. And I'm I'm glad you're now there to to lead the charge on on structured credit and and hopefully um, 
really, like I said, bring this to the masses as, as a risk management tool. So uh, th thank you for being on the program. And um, to our listeners, thank you for tuning in. If, if you didn't tune in, we wouldn't have a reason to do these podcasts. And we always appreciate your um, listenership here at Credibly Challenged.